podcast. Are you ready to go, Scott? Let's do it. All right. Fantastic. Awesome. We're going to let people funnel on in for the next visible webinar series here with, with Scott. Uh, thanks for everyone for taking your time out of the day to, to join. I'm glad we're getting in this now. I just saw that uh, Elon Musk is sending man to space at 1.30 Pacific. So uh, we're not competing yet against uh, SpaceX and sending uh, astronauts to the space station, which is great. Uh, so as people trickle in, uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes. We'll, we'll cover this again. Uh, we always get asked the question, are you recording this? Uh, we are. Uh, if you registered for the webinar, you will get an email follow up at some point this week with the recording, as well as the write up and recap. We'll highlight any resources that we covered. Uh, and then if you are not registered, uh, just take a look on our blog. It's just visible.vc slash blog and uh, we'll, we'll have all the content and recording there. Uh, so we're gonna give it another minute here or so before we get started. i uh, excited to introduce Scott uh, for our next webinar series. And uh, make sure to register um, on, on Visible and the Founders Award blog for all of our future ones. We have one coming up with uh, Elizabeth Yin here later in June from the Hustle Fund. Uh, Elizabeth is actually our first ever uh, webinar host and panelist back in, in the fall. So excited to have her on again. Um, but we will just kick this thing off. So uh, really excited to introduce Scott. Uh, for you, for maybe just to get started, for those that don't know me yet, my name is Mike Cruz. I'm the founder and, and CEO of Visible. Uh, we help companies report to their investors, build relationships with potential investors, uh, and now manage their fundraising process. And recently also launched a, a new platform for investors to help monitor their portfolio and, and give their founders a, a better chance of, of success. Uh, I first met Scott back in in 2014, Visible kind of served as a, as a prototype, I guess, if you will, for, for what the high alpha model is today. Uh, and, and Scott uh, started Exact Target back in, in was it 1999, Scott, or, or 2000? I, I read conflicting things online. It was, it was December of 2000. Okay, so December of, of 2000. I, I think Scott is maybe one of the only people in the world that uh, was the founder and CEO of a company. Uh, took it through two downturns, both the dot-com and, and 2008 financial crisis. Uh, took it public, uh, which eventually sold to Salesforce for uh, $2.5 billion of premium on the, on the public markets and, and part of the Salesforce marketing cloud. And now, Scott, you are the uh, general partner and, and one of the founding partners of, of High Alpha, uh, based in Indianapolis, uh, building the next generation of B2B enterprise SaaS uh, cloud companies and as part of your studio also having a venture fund investing in SaaS companies, I believe all over the world now, right? Because you have folks in, in, uh, right. in the Nordic countries and in, in Canada, but uh, how did I do with, with the intro there? Perfect, that was excellent. Thank you, Mike, and uh, thanks for having me on the program and nice to, uh, nice to meet everybody out there. Yeah, awesome. Um, before we get started, Scott, I know you are a huge uh, relationships guy, and I would love to hear how you're handling all of this remote world now, right? Going from in-person relationships and, and building rapport with people to this kind of digital first or digital only format. It's like, how are you dealing with it? Pretty well. I, I feel like I feel like I'm adjusting well, Mike. I think like, like all of us, I'm on Zoom calls all day and um, I love Zoom, love Zoom so much, so impressed with the company, but, uh, but every now and then it's nice just to have a regular phone call or text exchange as well. But I, I think the same principles apply, which is you know, showing people you care about them, you're thinking about them, and using whatever form of communication you have to get your message across. Yeah, have you have you changed your approach to to maybe meeting someone for the first time now through Zoom, where maybe that was kind of in person at the at the high alpha offices before? Yeah, exactly. It's really interesting. I was speaking with a woman earlier today who's a, a writer for CNBC, and she's really doing an interesting piece on Midwest tech. And uh, we had a great Zoom call, like we've been doing for the last three months. And she's actually <laughs> going to come to Indy later this summer. And it was almost startling to have to actually think about scheduling an in-person meeting. <laughs> <laughs> kind of nice. I hope, I hope that we're, we're turning the corner here. Yeah, awesome. Well, we're going to get into the content here. Uh, before we do, if anyone has questions out there, uh, feel free to submit them through Zoom chat. We're going to try to keep this to, to 30 to 45 minutes and, and be respectful of, of your time and, and Scott's. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, but if you, if you just joined in, uh, we will send a recording. So no need to send that question in. We're going to send that recording out with, with, with the recap. And, and today, uh, you know, I think Scott is the true definition of, when I think of a leader, uh, uh, Scott uh, exemplifies what, what a leader really is. And I think that's something that is probably overlooked 
especially early on when, when building companies, we talk about product market fit and fundraising and metrics, but uh, a lot of times we don't talk about leadership. And uh, this is something that I have really started to dig into recently, especially now that, you know, for the better part of the last 10 years, it's been a, a pretty great market to be a founder and raise capital. But now for the first time, a lot of people are getting a, a front row seat or, or view into what it's like to lead in an uncertain time. I couldn't think of a, a better person than, than Scott to, to pick his brain about this. And so we're really going to cover leadership, uh, communication and, and, and fundraising uh, in, this, in this next 30 minutes we have with, with Scott's time and really kind of picking apart how uh, Scott built the exact target uh, in, in both of those downturns, uh, took it public, but then also now Scott, you know, sits on the other side where now he's starting B2B SaaS enterprise companies again, but also in investing in them. So really want to, to pick uh, Scott's brain there. And so just sort of treating this as a, as a fireside chat for a second, Scott, um, you know, as mentioned, you, you've seen exact target through, through two different types of downturns and, and now says an investor, you know, how should founders think about their fundraising strategy in, in a downturn like we're in right now uh, versus maybe an up cycle where we were a, a year ago? Yeah, great, Mike. And, you know, in a downturn, I'll at least give you a little sample of some of the, yeah. of the advice and coaching, you know, that we're, we're providing to our portfolio companies. And one is kind of cash is king. So you really have to understand the cash dynamics of your business. That's always important, but in a downturn, it's even more important. So I think first and foremost is really understanding cash flow, burn rate, how many months you have until you're out of capital and, and manage that in a really smart way. The last thing you wanna do is be running out of capital. Hopefully you can raise new venture money and, and you find it's a difficult market to do it. So, so I think that's kind of first. Second is making sure that you're closer than ever to customers and you're getting as creative as possible to add value. And, and customers are going through the same uncertainty and choppiness that we are and it's important that their partners reach out show that they're thoughtful they care about them they you want to preserve and grow the relationship and you want to help maybe in ways you hadn't thought of before so i think like creativity is really king as it relates to you know focusing on the customer and then with fundraising if you do need to raise capital i think it's important to be able to showcase for investors how your business is going to perform through an economic downturn and some businesses actually perform better um, others, you know, perform about the same and, and then, you know, others don't kind of fare so well. So I think it's important that your, your narrative and your messaging is how you're going to not only survive, but you're going to thrive, you know, during tougher times, which ultimately gets down to, are you a need to have or a nice to have? And, you know, great software companies find a way to be a need to have. They, they find a way to be mission critical. They find a way that it's highly unlikely their best customers are ever going to pull them out. In fact, they just want to keep growing the relationship. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I was listening recently uh, to your one, one of the recent podcasts you're on, and you were talking about uh, this this point in which you were going up market at Exact Target, and uh, we're pitching with with Expedia, and you were kind of in, in a pitch off against some other folks that were already in the, the enterprise space, and you mentioned that you know you were kind of selling a vision and, and, and building a relationship with with Expedia and, and getting them as a customer. You know, how how do you think founders should should go about setting some of that vision where maybe the product's like 80 percent of the way there um you know and, and maybe not fully built out but you're trying to land and get creative with these customers and bring them on board H how did you do that so effectively back in back in the exact target days yeah that's a great question mike i, I think it's important for early stage companies to project uh, kind of an image of confidence and, and a vision and in some ways you know you want to kind of look bigger than you are you want to be authentic and honest but you, you want to show that you're, uh, you're stable, you're growing, and you're innovative. And, and I think that can be done through the website. It can also be done through building those client relationships that you're referencing, Mike. And, you know, at Exact Target, we, we, were, we were looking for clients that wanted to go on a three, five, 10-year journey with us. And we really positioned our platform and our company as, you know, your marketing software partner for today, but also well into the future. And, and those clients want a long-term relationship. They don't want to go through an RFP and evaluation and contracting every year. They want to lock in with the partner that they can grow with. So with that being said, I think it's important that you're not only conveying who you are today as a company, but more importantly, where you're going and really help 
really help clients see the future and see the bigger vision of where you can go together. And often that means you can't meet every one of their needs today. You know, to your point, for, for all of our big clients, we maybe only had 75, 80% of the capability, but we committed that together we'd build the rest and we build a lot more. And there's just nothing better than building your business kind of arm in arm with clients who want to take you there. We also had clients that wanted us to be more global. So when we opened you know, an office in, in London and Australia and in different parts of Europe, it was often with a key client that really, it was really important that we had a local presence in a market they cared about. So I just found, you know, listening, building the trusting relationship with, with partners and then showing the bigger vision of what you can build together was a really nice way to build the business. Yeah, um, just looking at, uh, I'll pull this slide up here. Uh, Matt on our team uh, put this together where we have the, the exact target timeline here. And uh, the S&P is, is kind of layered as the, the line you see. Uh, and so you can see, uh, you know, what I found really interesting, Scott, is exact target didn't raise a whole lot of capital uh, compared to, to what you're seeing today, right? I, I believe, how much capital did you raise before going public? You know, I tried to figure this out. There's like these two $70 million rounds, but it seems like well less than, than $200 million was raised in total for exact target before, before going public. Yeah, I know, Mike. Right? We, we were we were so capital efficient. It was it was kind of a shocking level of capital efficiency, and I think it was just us being frugal and you know starting the company kind of after the dot com you know bubble had burst. We we found really economical, thrifty, crafty ways to build the business. So you won't even believe these numbers, Mike, but I'll I'll, uh, I'll share them. So we yeah. raised about two hundred thousand in friends and family, yeah. and then we raised. 1.5 million in angel capital. So that's 1.7. And then in 04, this, by the way, this chart is amazing. I've, I've never <laughs> seen a journey map to the s and I, I saw this yeah. last night and I couldn't believe it. I saved it. I saved it to my phone. I, I really appreciate it. So we raised 10 and a half million in 2004 from Insight, okay. but uh, six of it went to secondary, only four and a half went to primary. And okay. the secondary was the three of us who started the company, we worked for, you know, the first year without taking a salary and, and very suppressed, you know, salaries really for the first three or four years of the business. So it allowed us and some of our early investors to, you know, take some money off the table and kind of restore some financial stability to our family and, and then really allow us to kind of dream big and, you know, really, really aim toward building a really large business. But here's what's interesting. So we had only raised about 6 million in primary when we filed to go public the first time. And that was, <laughs> I was, uh, that was December of 07. And you can see wow. from the chart, that felt like a great time. It, you know, SaaS, smaller SaaS companies were starting to go public. We, we finished 07 at 48 million in gap revenue. And then 08, interestingly enough, we finished at 72 in gap revenue. So think about that. We had only raised yeah. 6 million in capital and we built the company to 72 in gap revenue. And we still had four or five million on the balance sheet. We were profitable. So we, we were really optimistic that we would have a successful IPO. And then as you can see, the market just absolutely fell to pieces. Yeah. And we, we, ended up, we ended up having to stay on file for like five or six quarters, just waiting for the market to turn around. And, and it never did. You know, a little, little old exact target out of Indianapolis wasn't going to be the first SaaS company to kind of break open the IPO market. So that's when we ended up deciding to pull the IPO. Same day, we announced the 70 million funding in May, and we raised another 70 in December, and then we really went for it. You know, and that was the moment where we hit the, hit the accelerator and really yeah. started to scale in a, in a material way. And then thankfully, the IPO in 2012 went much better. There's, there's a couple uh, parts that I would love to touch on there. Uh, and, and one of them is kind of this operating in a downturn uh, I mean, it allowed you to, to attract some great talent that you might have otherwise not, not received, right, it, for, for exact target early on, right? Maybe that's, um, you know, people that are they're free agents on the market that maybe were laid off somewhere or looking for a change. But how did, how did you, you know, uh, leverage the, the, the downturn, um, you know, selfishly for, for your benefit in terms of early on? Like, it seems like that was an opportunity for you guys where uh, you use the downturn as a way to, to actually bring on all this amazing talent to, to, to exact target. Yeah, we did, we did it twice, Mike. We, we, we did it from the very beginning when we started the company. And then again, in the, in the downturn of 08 and 09, in the very beginning, 
you know, necessity is the mother of invention. You know, we just had to be very creative because we had no money, you know, so <laughs> we, we did, we did two things to create a go to market motion. One was we literally hired all of our friends who had been laid off from dot com companies and we, yeah. we, we basically paid them hundred percent commission and gave them equity. And then two, we found that ad agencies were a powerful channel where they could take our technology and sell it into their customer base. And those were like the two best moves we made. And our, our revenue was a rocket ship. So we started, we really, we formed the company in December of 2000, started building product in January, February of 01, had our first customer in kind of May, June. And that first year, Mike, we did about 300K in bookings, partially <laughs> here. Yeah, and then wait, and then next the next year we did three million. And next year we did nine million uh, on almost no funding. But we had we had all these you know friends of ours that were amazing at at yeah. selling and bringing customers on board. And we promised them if we if we ever got funded, we'd flip into employees, and we did. So I look back on an old slide deck, and we there's one point where we had like sixty employees in the company, and we had like twenty five in sales. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we were, we were very sales heavy from the beginning, right? but you know, it, it, it worked well for us. And then in, um, in 08, 09, we just had a lot of confidence that we were, we were sticky. We were adding value. Marketers who were cutting budgets were continuing to invest in digital. So we made a, a counterintuitive move to invest really aggressively in the business in that 08, 09 timeframe. And it, it really set us up for success at a time when our competitors were contracting, you know, our, uh, Sequoia had that famous, uh, you know, kind of slide deck that came out in, in 08, 09, like Good Times RIP, and they had all their clients, you know, all their portfolio uh, companies, you know, lay off 20, 25% of their staff. And we did the opposite. We started hiring, we started expanding, we were much more opportunistic, and it really got us rolling. So when we, we headed into the IPO in 12, our growth rate was accelerating. You know, we had, we had benefited from hiring, um, a lot of sales reps and opening up new offices. And as you know, you know, the payoff on that isn't 12, it's, it's not really for 12, 18, 24 months. So we kind of went into the IPO with accelerating momentum and a growth rate that was going up. Well, what kind of, a, I think this is a great segue into, to, you know, how are you coaching, you know, earlier stage founders right now? I'm sure it's case by case, but maybe kind of party line, you know, are, yeah. are you telling them to be aggressive and, and hire some of these people that may, might be on the market now or or is it still kind of a, a wait and see uh like what is what is the general kind of gut reaction to to how an early stage founder let's say they have some level of, of product market fit right now just for, for this example are you are you saying hey we should be hiring for these these amazing people that might be on the market or is it still a, a wait and see uh, in, in your mind you know it's so case by case mike i think it's so yeah. it's so different based on each company you know what's their product offering, how solid is product market fit, how stable is their funding. So for, for those where there's just a lot of uncertainty, the advice has been generally been just pause hiring, you know, just kind of tap yeah. the brakes on hiring, let, you know, let things settle down a little bit, let your revenue catch up. Focus on if, if buyers aren't buying with quite the same, you know, velocity they have in the past, what else can you do during this time to set your, yourself up for future success. Like where can you make an investment that you just know it's gonna pay off a year from now? It may not be hiring more BDRs and putting more into sales, but it could be content. It could be investing more in product. You know, something that's gonna have a long-term benefit. So just trying to help companies think through where to best shift resources during this uncertain time. Yeah, so speaking of, of uncertainty, um, and, and we, we've talked about this quite a bit as well, Scott, but you know, Let's talk about communication for, for a second. I think uh, communication is something close and, and dear to your, your, your heart, Scott. You, you wrote this Friday note that has these epic stories, but one every single Friday, rain or shine, and a note was going out to the entire organization about what's going on in your world, customer stories, and, and bringing this really transparent uh, culture to exact target. Um, you know, how should founders think about communication right now with their team? Uh, and, and with their investors, you know, for example, you guys once filed the IPO, you had to pull it. Like, how did you communicate with with Exact Target at that time? And, and how should founders think about communication with those with those key stakeholders today? Yeah, you bet. That's why I love Visible so much, Mike. I love <laughs> I love the essence of what you do. I think it's so important that founders communicate with their with their team members, with their partners, with their customers, and and with their investors. And I think often most under communicate, you know, or maybe. Yeah 
they'd be making the mistake of saying, I don't, I don't, I don't want to bother, you know, my investors and they, they don't communicate where they need help or, or how things are going or kind of keep people engaged, you know, along the way. I found during, you know, during our ET journey, we, we were an email platform. So it was natural, you know, that we would lean, yeah. we would lean heavily on email and we communicated with our investors very actively. And we found so many of our investors, in particular, our angel investors, they, they cared about a financial return, but they actually cared more about just being along for the journey. Like they just yeah. they cared more about coming to the holiday party, knowing that we were hiring lots of young people and giving them an opportunity and making a difference in their life. You know, they, they care about the intangibles. And the only way you can communicate the intangibles is to kind of bring them in and, and help them be part of the experience. Um, through ET, this downturn is, was a big period of learning for me. So we were, we were in the quiet period for you know, that year and a half we were on file. And, and Mike, when you're in the quiet period, you can't communicate anything about the future. Yeah. You have to be so careful and cautious. And, and I was communicating less to our team than I had in the past. And I just got a lot of feedback that like, hey, we feel like we don't know what's going on, what's happening. And it was, it was right at that time that I made a commitment around this Friday note to say, I, I'm going to communicate at the end of the day, every Friday, what's happening. Just, you know, what am I doing? Where am I traveling? What am I thinking about? Highlights across the company, challenges that we're facing, just rain or shine. You know, you're going to hear from me every Friday. And I, I never wanted an employee to ever say again, like, I, I don't know what's going on. Like, I just wanted to, I wanted to cure that uh, or to the best of my ability, uh, solve it. And what it was amazing. It's just, it was amazing. It created a, it created a, a history book of the exact target story. It created a, a, you know, kind of continual flow of communication between me and the team. Uh, my favorite part was I would encourage responses and I'd get responses every week. Um, ideas, feedback, criticism, encouragement, ideas for the next Friday note of content. And it just helped me create a one-to-one -one relationship with our team when we got very big, you know, when, when a one-to-one -one yeah. relationship almost wasn't practical, it was a very personal way that I could communicate uh, with our team. And, and this kind of gets into the leadership topic, Mike, but what, what, I, what I strove for, and I think is important for leaders, is I, I wanted the team to feel like they could count on me, like they could trust mm -hmm. me, that I was steady, I was reliable, I was going to show up every day and give it my best. And, and making sure that I never missed a Friday was just important. Like I felt like once I made a commitment, whether I was on vacation or traveling or not feeling well, or who knows what the circumstances were, I was just going to get that note out every Friday. It was my promise. It was my commitment to the team. And, um, and I was glad I was able to uphold it. And, uh, and, and that felt good. That's, yeah, that's incredible. I, um, you know, I tried to write a Friday note and this past weekend, you know, didn't go through. <laughs> um, so it's just like, I had a holiday. Well, fun, fun, so, fun little anecdote yeah. too, Mike, is that when I, when I ended up uh, stepping aside at Salesforce, my, my going away present to all of our team members was a book, uh, Five Years of Friday Notes, and we kind of assembled all the Friday notes and I gave it away as a, as a gift to all of our employees. And it, it really is kind of the best uh, history book, you know, or, or you know, documentation, I would say, of our journey, yeah. what we were feeling, thinking, experiencing every step of the way. Yeah, that's awesome. So with, with, with leadership and, and, and how you, you evolved as a leader, who are some, you know, folks that you looked up to or, or leaned on as you, you know, literally started as a team of three with, you know, your, your founders at exact target and eventually took a public and, and sold like, did, did those people you, you leaned on change over time? And, and who did you look for, for, for guidance and, and mentorship and, and to sharpen your, your leadership skills? I, I was fortunate to have, you know, so many great investors, you know, and mentors along the way, Mike, you know, the first was a guy named Bob Compton, who is our lead angel investor and was chairman for the first seven years, incredibly talented uh, software investor, leader, CEO. So, you know, I learned a lot from Bob. When Insight came in in 2004, you know, what really got me excited about Insight was that they had a, a hands-on consulting group called uh, Insight Onsite where you could have them come in, they'd break down a project, really, really help you. And they had a lot of quarterly learning programs that I attended every one I could. And then not only learning from inside, I could learn from all their portfolio companies. And, and that was attractive to me. So yeah. the, the, one, of the, one of the gifts I had, I think going through this for the, for the first time, Mike, was I, 
I truly had no idea what I was doing. Like, I mean, I really didn't. I felt like I had a strong business and sales and marketing background. And I had just, um, I just earned my MBA at Kellogg. So I, I felt like I had a good business foundation, but I, I almost knew nothing, you know, about building software and scaling a software company. So as a result, I was just in a, I was just in a learning mindset every step of the way. And one of the nicest compliments Insight gave me was that they, they said I attended more of their learning programs than any other CEO they had worked with. And I, I just went to everything. I, I went to yeah. the CEO programs, but I also went to all the, uh, all the department programs too. If there was a program on customer success, I was there, software development, uh, data science, you know, it, it didn't matter. I just felt like I need to learn as much as I could. And I, I learned a lot from them. And then, and then attending those programs, you also meet your peers, you know, and, and learning from your peers is incredibly important. So I leaned heavy on other CEOs who were going through a similar set of experiences. Yeah, I could, you guys have, have replicated that, I think, not to, to plug High Alpha too much, but uh, for those, for those who, who are new to, to High Alpha, uh, provides a speaker series where, Scott, I think you have even one maybe coming up tomorrow with, a, with the speaker yeah. series with the Revolution team uh, to doing uh, domain, you know, the, uh, uh, flight schools where you talk about customer success, marketing, sales, the CEO offsite, which I, which I enjoy quite a bit. Um, and you mentioned curiosity. I was listening to the David Scott podcast where uh, it transitioned to uh, Salesforce is now acquired exact target. And for the first time in, you know, 12, 14 years, you have a, a boss or manager in the name of Mark Benioff. Yeah, sure. And I would love just to hear, you know, what did you learn from, from Mark in those like 13 months where, where you were reporting into him every week? And, and where, where are some takeaways you had going from, you know, being the CEO founder of, of exact target to, to now part of this Salesforce and, and, and working with, with Mark. Yeah, that, that was an amazing experience, Mike. I, a couple of examples I've used, you know, at, at Exec Target, we were, we were 2,000 employees, global, public, you know, market cap north of a billion. Yeah, we were, we were a big company yeah. and, uh, and doing very, very well, you know, still growing, you know, north of 40% every year. And hop, hopping into Salesforce was, was unbelievable. It's like the, you know, the athletic analogy of like playing, you know, college football and then you get into the NFL and everything's just moving faster. That's yeah. kind of what I felt like it was, it was like getting my PhD in SAS, the, the sense of urgency, the um, dream big mentality, uh, aggressive mindset um, at Salesforce was unlike anything I'd seen. You know, I, I loved it. It was working for Mark specifically was an incredible experience. I was surprised and impressed with how involved he was in running the day-to-day -day of the business. Um, very involved in uh, product, go-to-market, kind of all dimensions of the business. Very impressed, which would not surprise you, of just Mark being such a visionary. He, he was always thinking two or three years out and, and had teams working on Dreamforce two or three years out. You know, and it's so, you know, for, for all the early stage entrepreneurs that are listening, you know, I think so many of us are focused on the week, the month, maybe the quarter, maybe the year. It's really difficult to think two, three, four years out Mark was amazing at doing that. Uh, the V2 mom planning process was, was remarkably effective. We adopted that at exact target quite well. And then, and maybe the last thing I would just mention, Mike, is, and I've spoken about this a couple of times, but is Mark speaks of this beginner's mindset, which kind of gets mm -hmm. back to the learning mindset we were speaking on, of just putting himself in a situation to learn and, and to have the beginner's mindset where you don't convince yourself, you know, everything, but yeah. you, you and your team and the organization acknowledge where things aren't working, where are you failing, where can you get better? And then just having, having the beginning mindset. And this is a funny story I've told a few times, but my, my first one-on-one -on -one with Mark, I we were supposed to meet at a hotel in Indy. I ran over to the hotel. He wasn't there. His assistant, Joe, said he was at the shopping mall, uh, Circle Center Mall in downtown Indy, and that I should just go over there and we'd have a walking one-on-one. -on -one. So I, I hustled over the mall, and he was in the AT&T store learning about their connected home products. And he was a sales <laughs> associate. I mean, literally had no idea uh, who she was speaking to. No idea it was Mark. And he was just thoughtful, respectful, and just asking question after question to really understand the future of IoT and connected homes and AT&T's take on building products in that space. And for, you know, for all the emails and phone calls and meetings that he'd actually take time, you know, to hop over to the mall and, and do a little side project, a little field, 
field trip was was pretty interesting. But but it all kind of comes back to having the beginner's mindset and the learning mindset, despite whatever level of success you've achieved. Yeah, I I love that story. I just I can just picture Mark in the AT and T store. He's what six five, six. He's pretty tall, right? And just exactly. learning about the the latest Alexa or IoT. Uh, exactly, exactly. And then and then we I walked around the mall it. and we walked around the mall and did our one on one. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's awesome. Uh, so speaking of beginner's mindset, um, one of the things that I think we love doing at, at the High Alpha CEO Offsides, we talk about books and, and uh, what you're reading. And, and uh, you know, Scott, I think you're a huge fan of, of Good to Great, but what other like books or, or recommendations do you, you know, things that come to mind that you love uh, when it comes to leadership and some of the things that have, have struck a chord with, with you? Yeah, you, you and I talked about that, Mike. I love good to great. That's that's always kind of my my go to. That was really our guide during the ET years. Um, you know, I, I I do love books on business and leadership, and one that I read recently was uh, Ride of a Lifetime. Uh, Bob Iger talking about his okay. career yeah. and run at Disney, and I I found that one to be fascinating. And uh, we're fortunate today with so many you know videos and podcasts and and books and articles. There are so many different sources of inspiration and, and places to learn. But, but Ride of the Lifetime, I, I really I enjoyed that. And what I really enjoyed about it was just how Disney reinvented themselves. You know, Disney didn't rest on their laurels of just kind of leveraging the same character set. You know, they really went through an amazing run of acquisitions, starting with Pixar. And there's a great story in there of Bob Iger building a relationship with Steve Jobs. And, um, and that was fun. I, I, I love Shoe Dog, Phil Knight's uh, Nike yeah. story. Uh, and Shoe Dog is so great because it really focuses on, you know, the early days of building Nike. Didn't really get into the Michael Jordan era, but, uh, yeah. but the early days of Nike, I thought were pretty fascinating. So I have a question for you. This is, this is a hotly debated topic uh, in the Proust household. So you have, uh, my wife just read uh, Shoe Dog as well. Also, right at, at this time, The Last Dance comes out. I promise <laughs> right, I was going to work right. The Last Dance in. Okay, do you, I mean, it's crazy. Nike is not that old of a company, actually, when you really think about it. So do you think Nike made Mike and MJ, or do you think MJ made Nike? Or do you think wow. they were both going to be huge no matter what? But like, you know, people are like, oh, you know, Michael owes so much to Nike. And I'm like, I don't know. I think it could be the other way around. I, I, I don't know. What do you, what do you think? I think it could be the other way around as well. I, uh, but I mean, I think, I think they, I think they built one another, you know, and, and kind of did it arm in arm, you know, and watching, watching the last dance, you know, with you and I both having uh, some, you know, IU basketball heritage, yeah. Bob Knight during the 84 Olympics saying Jordan was the best player he'd ever seen after he had had those undefeated, you know, the undefeated season in the national championships at IU. I think, I think that was pretty telling of just yeah. how extraordinarily gifted Jordan was at an early age. I, by the yeah. way, I've only watched I've only watched the first four episodes. I I've been trying to savor it. I'm not all the way through. Oh, have you Have you watched them all? I've watched them all. Um, it kind of replaced sport for me, at least on Sundays. Yeah. So I've watched them all, and that was like my childhood growing up in Chicago. I can name you. You know, I, I hated Reggie Miller at the time. I'm sorry to all of our Indian <laughs> um, fans, but I was like, man, I hate Reggie Miller. And then like Sean Kemp and Gary Payton on on the Sonics. It, it's interesting. So I don't think this is giving. There's no spoilers here. Yeah. Um, Michael Jordan was, was, was tough on his teammates, yeah. right? He yeah. was, um, you know, expected greatness and, and can come off maybe as, um, you know, a dick, I guess, in, in the nicest way, like in, in your, I'm on Twitter reading, you know, all these comments from, from venture and they're like, yeah. yeah, it's okay to be that, right. If you're expecting greatness and building your company, but I look at what, what you've accomplished, Scott, with humility and, and grace and, and, and humbleness and how you led a company to, to success, like, you know. I guess, why do, why do people think that you have to kind of be, I guess, a jerk to, to get the best out of people where I think you're a, a counterpoint to that, right? Where built something great with, with amazing people and, and built a culture that I think people call like tangible, like you could taste it, like uh, that people love being part of. So how, how did you, um, you know, go about building a business like people first, uh, where like all the headlines are on, you know, Jordan or Steve Jobs or ever, you know, more or less being, being jerks to, to people that they worked with. I know. I, I, I'm with you, Mike. I don't, I don't buy that. You have to be, you have to be a, a jerk or put people down, you know, in order to be a, a great leader or success. I think you can still set a standard of excellence, but be uh, kind and caring and thoughtful. You know, that's, yeah. 
that's certainly what we we always try to achieve at ADT, and I I try to achieve you know, in living my life is I think you can, you can be hyper competitive, you can have a very high standard, you can expect a lot out of yourself and others, but you can still, and you should be respectful in, in how you communicate, treat and care for others. You know, our, our first core value at Exact Target was treat people well, and you just kind of the golden rule, you know, yeah. and I, I've always found that to be a, a really good guiding principle. So I know I, 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 it's interesting, I've been kind of watching that on Twitter also, and just not agreeing, honestly, that you, you, have to put others down or, you know, degrade teammates because they don't have the same work ethic or, or same standard of excellence you do. I, I don't think that's a great, great way to inspire yeah. people to be the best or get the most out of them. Yeah. I think there's a certain sex appeal that comes with that. And from a media perspective, you know, this yeah, person's yeah. a jerk and they're, they're great. Uh, what I think the media doesn't do is tell you the stories of all the people that were jerks and failed. Um, <laughs> exactly. Or, exactly. Or, or exactly. all of the, the great people that succeeded, right? There's a certain, um, uh, appeal to the jerk that's succeeding because it makes you feel like, oh, I could act like that. Uh, but uh, I think that there would be, I, I would love to watch a documentary with someone that was a jerk and ruined all the relationships and, and failed. I think that would be a good counterpoint to that. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. So, uh, okay, well, we promised 45 minutes. And, and so wrapping up here, just a, a couple questions that have come in and, and um, some others that have, that have filtered through. So um, one of these adages you have, Scott, is around your personal IQ. I, I heard this recently as well on a podcast and your personal board of directors. Um, I would love to have you just touch on that. I think it's super fascinating. By the way, I think it's fascinating that um, the high alpha team is, has incorporated what I would consider like, you know, business strategy into your personal lives. You have the personal board of directors. Christian has the core values with his family. Uh, I, I find that pretty fascinating, but I would love to hear about your personal board of directors and what that means to you. And and how you know maybe the audience at home should think about taking that with with them and, and doing an exercise this weekend. Yeah, I know that sounds great, Mike. So you know, just on the IQ side, you know, I kind of heard this saying, and I really loved it. Of your, you know, your IQ is the average of the five or six people you spend the most time with of their IQ. You know, and, and the, the punchline is surround yourself with really smart people. You know, surround yeah. yourself with people that help you grow. You know, and and bring out the very best in you. There's no reason not to. And Think about that as it relates to friends or people you're dating or a spouse or a partner and certainly business teammates. You know, one of the greatest parts, I think, of being a founder or being a CEO is you get to, you get to hire who you work with yep. and, and make sure you surround yourself with people that, that are amazing and are positive and, and are smart, you know, and, and bring out your best. The second one is that is the personal board of directors. And I uh, picked this up along the way and I really love it. And it's when you, when you think about building a board for a business, you want a board that's diverse and a board that can help you in different ways, complementary ways. And, and boy, we sure had that you know, every step of the way at ET. The personal board of directors is the same concept of think about the six people or so in your life that you lean on and you want to lean on for guidance, for support, for encouragement, and and, and think about them in different facets of your life. It could be someone you lean on uh, for faith or someone you lean on for business advice or someone you lean on for personal balance and, and tangibly think about who's your personal board of directors. Who are the people you count on, you trust, and, and you want to lean on them for, uh, for guidance and support. And then, and that's nice to let them know, you know, and, and people are honored to know that they're, you know, part of your, uh, your inner circle or your personal board of directors and, um, and don't be afraid to ask for help. I think that's a good punchline. Yeah. People like to help one another, and and um, and you know, don't be don't feel like you're bothering people. You know, feel, lean on lean on people for help in in all kinds of ways. I love that. Uh, I'm I'm doing that this weekend. <laughs> good, uh, good. Write it down. It's it's a great yeah. exercise when you're really like, okay, literally, who's my personal board of directors? And you know, it can be parents or siblings or your spouse or you know, but make sure it includes some you know friends and and other people in your life as well. Yeah, uh, I, I love that. Um, okay, great. So wrapping up with, with a couple questions, uh, has high alpha changed its investment criteria or the types of companies you're looking at, uh, you know, bar higher, um, you know, are you seeing maybe even for companies you're investing in or your current portfolio are, are terms changing? Uh, you know, are you weighting certain things maybe differently than you had just, you know, would love, I think people would love to hear kind of, you know, what is high alpha looking for now? Has that changed? Yeah, I'd be happy to Mike. So so, uh, you know, for the audience, High Alpha, we're one part startup studio where we start new cloud companies and then one part venture fund. And on the venture side, 
I would say, you know, we're still, we're still in investing and sourcing deals and building relationships. I think you could probably say, Mike, the bar is, is, is a bit higher. We're, yep. we're only going to invest in companies that we have a high degree of confidence or at least going to be stable, you know, kind of during the economic downturn. I would say valuations have drifted down a little bit. But the good news is SaaS as an asset class is still doing remarkably well. You know, the public comps have just been outstanding. So I think it shows that SaaS is resilient and SaaS is really, you know, integral to how businesses run today. On the studio side is where we've seen, I'd say, more of a stark difference. Mike, we, we are starting more companies in 2020 than any prior year by yeah. far. I think it'll be, I think it'll be two to three X any, any prior year. We have, we have seven or eight new companies we're starting. So, and, and the way I think about it is with disruption comes opportunity. You know, we have yeah. a whole, whole new set of problems and challenges for how businesses can operate in this uh, stay from home motion and through this pandemic. And as sad and tragic as it is, it does create new problems, which means new opportunities and new companies. So we're finding a, I'd say an interesting set of new problems to solve with technology and then, um, and then more talent in the market. You know, to your point earlier, Mike, there's more talent in the market of talented tech leaders and executives who want to go start a company. And they're like, why not? Now's a good time to go do it. And we're fortunate. We've got the capital. We have the infrastructure. We're kind of ready to roll. So I would say still investing on capital, maybe just a, a little bit slower than our former pace, but far more aggressive and leaning in on the studio side. That's phenomenal. Yeah, I, just a data point to add on to that. I, I think I saw Stripe. So Stripe has Stripe Atlas where they help incorporate new businesses and, and launch new companies. And Stripe put out a report, I think uh, year over year, 100% growth in terms of people starting companies on, on the Stripe platform. So people are certainly, maybe it was a forcing function because they were furloughed or laid off, but people are starting new companies now, which is uh, just, just absolutely fantastic. Uh, Final question is, is kind of around founding team and, and, and founders. How, how do you evaluate, you know, a solo founder versus teams of founders, and 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 how do you like to see them complement, you know, one another? I think looking back now, you would say exact target, you know, it was three kind of business founders, which kind of breaks the rules for maybe what you'd be right. looking for today. But how, how do you guys evaluate a founding team, whether that's a company you're starting, you know, one of those you know, companies you're, you're building this year in 2020 or, or one you're investing in, what do you, what do you look for in, in those founding teams? And is it bad to be a, someone had a question around solo founder versus, uh, you know, a group of, a group of founders? Sure. You know, for me, Mike, I'm so kind of relationship driven, you know, and people driven. I, I, I really look at uh, kind of team first and, yeah. and I, I really start with just trying to, trying to understand a person's uh, track record, their character, how they conduct themselves. Is this a person that I feel like I can trust and want to be in business with, you know, for the next 10 years? Yeah. And, and then beyond that, whether it's co-founders or maybe just even their team they've built, have they built it? Can they, can they attract high quality people to join, join them on their journey? And can they attract people that compliment them, you know, that, that fill in for your gaps? And it's, it's, I mean, none of us, none of us are perfect. We all have weaknesses and gaps and deficiencies. And I think it's, it's those founders that kind of know their strengths, but also know their shortcomings, where they need help, where they need to push and, and work really hard to find talented people to fill those gaps and complement them. And then what I really like to look for, uh, Mike, is how a CEO interacts with their team, with his or her team. Mm -hmm. Um, How do they, how do they introduce one another? When, When do they defer to them? Do they speak? speak to them with respect. Do they include them in the conversation? Because I find, you know, so much of leadership is bringing out the best in others and uh, knowing how to ask great questions, knowing how to get the best ideas on the table, sort through them and debate them as a team and then pick a direction and go. And I find a mistake. I I find a lot of founders and CEOs make in in particular, even in a pitch is, um, is just talking too much. And and I think some of that comes from nerves, but uh, just, talking too much and getting to the end of the hour session and not having any time for questions or conversation or chance for their team members to shine. So, uh, so that's always something to look at. Just a little piece of advice is, is make sure these conversations with investors really are conversations rather than more of a one-way dialogue. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing, Scott, I've taken away from you personally is just listening um, as, as a skill. I think our first interaction, I still remember it. 
uh, you were at Exact Target still at the time. I can't remember if this is before the acquisition or not, but it was at your office on, on the circle. And I was obviously nervous and you just listened. And I was like, what? I was not expecting that. You know, I think a lot of people default to just start giving advice and talking and talking and talking. And uh, you might've asked me a couple of questions, but uh, it, was, it was just something I've tried to take with me uh, through my journey as a founder is just, you know, listening more. Um, and, and I think that's just a, just a great skill when it comes to, to leadership. Um, so yeah, it's funny. I still, I still remember that, that interaction. Um, well, I want to thank you very much for your time and, and joining us today on, on talking your, through your journey. Uh, and just, I think it's great to hear some of those anecdotes and stories that great businesses can be built when uh, there's uncertainty and downturn and, and, and yourself and exact target are, are proof of that. Uh, but thanks for everyone for joining. Like I said, we'll, uh, we'll send this out afterwards. Uh, Scott, thank you much so much for joining and, and taking some time out of your day. Uh, we'll wrap up here and hope everyone has a great rest of their Wednesday. Thanks, Mike. Keep up the great work. Right. Thanks, everybody. Right. See you, everybody.